So my name is Osa Gaius. I work at a company called MailChimp in Atlanta. Uh, MailChimp's the world's largest uh, and, and leading small business automation platform. So we help small businesses do marketing. So this talk is called Linguistic Diversity or Beyond Object Oriented Programming. Uh, it was also originally titled Linguistic Domination and Translation is Kind of Hegemonic Practice. Uh, <laughs> but the conference organizers told me that was a bit strange and perhaps too long in the fit. Um, so yeah, naming, naming things is hard. As I mentioned, I work, I work at MailChimp. Um, and the, this talk originally originated uh, as, as part of my thinking on uh, why Elixir matters and why Erlang matters uh, as part of a keynote that I gave last year at CodeBeam in Stockholm. And so while prepping that talk, I sort of had to think very deeply about like, why does Elixir matter? Why does it matter to me as a programmer? Um, why have I chosen this as the language of choice? And as I began to think about it, you know, I sort of at first was writing a talk that was way more technical, lots of code, lots of uh, discussions of like design patterns. And at some point I pivoted and started thinking more deeply about like why my own experience has led me to, to work at, in functional programming for the majority of my career, either at work or on the side. And I started thinking more deeply about hegemony, right, and what hegemony means. So the talk today will sort of flow in, in such a manner. We'll talk about hegemony and what I mean by that. We'll talk about object-oriented programming and how it functions as a hegemon. And then we'll talk about some instances of how hegemony plays out in practice. And then lastly, we'll talk about how we can resist and what resistance means. And then we'll conclude and go to lunch. So what do I mean by hegemony? Uh, hegemony is this term that comes from the Greek term hegemonia. Uh, it's mostly used in international relations theory to mean you know, dominance by force. So, you know, physical, you know, attacks, war. So you can think of the U.S. as being the hegemon in the world because the U.S. has the largest military. Uh, you can think of China as being a hegemon uh, in, in the Asia Pacific because they have the largest military in that theater, right? So international relations theorists think of dominance and hegemony purely as being able to dominate and physically uh, alter space. Now, the second instance of hegemony that I find more interesting comes from cultural theory. And so you can think of hegemony in, in the cultural theory as the dominance in the level of ideas, in the level of thought, right? And hegemony in this sense functions through in certain institutions, right? So the news, the media, the state, these are different kinds of hegemony, different kinds of domination because they're not sort of physical, you know, boots on the ground or actual force. Uh, the Italian theorist Antonio Gramsci is where the majority of these ideas around hegemony as non-physical force comes from. And one instance of hegemony that's actually really interesting is, is lingua franca, right? So lingua franca, or the dominant language or the accepted language, is, is an instance of hegemony because it is a form of dominance that doesn't require you to invade other countries, right? Your language becomes the dominant language and everyone speaks it. I think a, a funny example of this is that I'm speaking to you now in English, uh, but I was born and raised in Nigeria, but no longer speak my mother tongue. I don't speak my father's language, my mother's language, I only speak English, right? Um, but no one ever beat me or told me, like, if I don't learn English, like, I'll be killed or something. Like, it never happened, right? Um, what instead happened was that I, I just accepted that English was the dominant language in the world, and I just began to speak English as an American because that was the way that I decided to be. So that's a form of dominance that doesn't require any physical domination, but it still is, right, you know, pervasive because I cannot speak the language that my mother or father spoke when they grew up, right? So for most international relations theorists like Joseph Nye, uh, they would argue that soft power, right, or dominance without using physical military force is actually a better strategy for domination, right? Because you don't actually have to invade countries and like kill people, just spread your culture. And so most of, of these theorists actually argue that America uh, is able to dominate today because you know, of Hollywood, because of American rap music. Uh, these are the actual tools of domination today because we don't have to spread American culture by force or by colonialism, we can just simply export culture. So I think this is interesting when we then look at object-oriented programming, right? Because, um, you know, no one here has ever been forced to write Java, right? I don't, hopefully not. <laughs> That'd be weird. Um, I don't know how you would even begin to force someone to write Java, right? Um, but 
nevertheless, we've all at some point learned Java, right? It's somehow it's come into our nomenclature. You've probably did it in school at some point. You might have like, had to learn it for a job interview somewhere. So in this way, like learning Java or Java as a language has hegemony, right? And more generally, object-oriented languages have hegemony. And if we look at you know, a graph of language popularity, we can see that Java, C, C++, these sort of classic object-oriented languages continue to dominate in terms of popularity, right? And then if we sort of extend that analogy and we begin to look at the number of jobs being posted, we see that these object-oriented languages still dominate, right? So however you measure it, whether by popularity or by number of sort of jobs being posted, in other words, employment for people, object-oriented languages dominate. And the question is like, how, how did that happen, right? Like that's not, that's weird. You know, like Java is not really that old a language. I mean, like why didn't Fortran win, right? Um, but I think what's interesting is when we look at Sun Microsystems, who sort of helped really make sure that Java became one of the most important languages of our generation. For Sun Microsystems, when you look at Eric Schmidt, who is the VP and the head of the Java group at the time, when you look at his language about how he phrases the, the challenges that they had from taking Java from being sort of this relatively irrelevant language to being one of the top languages, he calls it a quote unquote a war, right? A war for position, right? And I think that's very, very interesting because in his mind, you know, he sort of, you know, I think unknowingly is borrowing terms from international relations theory, borrowing terms from cultural theory, and he's, he's talking about this war for ideas, the need for strategies, and he talks about how some microsystems was able to, in the case of Java, take Java from an irrelevant language to being the dominant language for server-side programming. Um, which is interesting because the, their original goal was actually to make sure that Java would become a dominant front-end language. Um, but of course, we know that that did not work. So when we look at their strategy and when Eric Schmidt talks about what their strategy was, they talk about things like taking out newspaper articles in the front page of non-technical papers, right? This is like San Jose Mercury News. This is the stuff that like your grandma and your grandpa would read when they wake up in the morning. And it's like Sun Microsystems, Java. Um, and this was their strategy, right? This idea that we actually are fighting at the realm of ideas of popular culture. We're not really fighting over who you know, programs what language at work. We're more interested in let's talk to the business people. Let's talk to the average people on the street because when they begin to say Java, they essentially dominate the cultural nomenclature, right? Because people outside of programming are gonna start asking you, well, it's Java. And the people at the highest levels of decision making, the executives who don't program, are essentially gonna be talking about Java because this is what they read in the morning. We can extend this and we can even look back at old articles. These are from the uh, late 80s where they begin to coin the term Java as a universal software language, which no one even knows what that means, right? Like, what, what does it mean to be a universal software language? Um, but that's precisely their strategy, right? And they talk about this idea of talking about Java as this thing that can run everywhere and anywhere on any platform, even though it actually really couldn't. It only ran on a few platforms with actual support, but they were able to market themselves and essentially capture the, the realm of ideas by creating this language of themselves as the universal software language. Now, if we fast forward, we can think of Java now as the new hegemon, right? They, they have dominance. You can go to any big firm, um, a bank institution, anywhere in the world, and Java is a language that one has to know to be considered a credible programmer. So if we look at what this means today and what this, how this kind of plays out, um, for me, I think this is interesting because if we look at the big four, and for the big four, this is the term that Eric Schmidt coined when he got to Google, he, he calls the big four these companies, Facebook, Google, Amazon, and Apple, and he says these are the companies that essentially matter when it comes to technology. Everyone else is generally irrelevant, right? Um, and we can, we can kind of agree with that, right? Like these are the companies that make the products and control the data that we all are subjected to in one way or another. And if we look at one way in which these sort of institutions play out uh, is that if you want to get a job there, right, and let's, let's be clear, getting a job at one of these big four companies uh, is a very important thing, right? The, the amount of money you get paid, uh, the amount of prestige that it carries with you. Um, and for me as a Nigerian immigrant, you know, 
like working at the big four for my mom is like the biggest thing that could happen, right? It's like if my son works at Google, I have arrived, I can stop all my work, right? Uh, it doesn't make sense rationally, but it is a belief, right, that these companies are what it means to be successful as a programmer. So if you look at what it means to get into these companies, right, it means you have to take a programming test. And for Gramsci and for Michel Foucault, another French, a French sociologist, the test is a unique place at which power and dominance operates, right? Because it's a place where a student has to subject themselves and prove that they are knowledgeable about something. So you think of, for instance, in the US, to become an American citizen, you have to take an English test, right? Which says, I speak English and I actually understand the laws of this country and the language of this country, right? So it's an innocuous but also very important you know, part of making sure that someone is beholding to a certain set of beliefs. So at the big four, Google, et cetera, you have to take a test. And these tests tend to be in object-oriented languages. Um, your recruiter will do uh, what the mob does in the popular show The Sopranos, your recruiter will tell you, like, you don't have to take this in Java, but it's in your best interest to take this in Java, <laughs> right? Uh, and so for me, you know, I, after undergrad, you know, I, I worked at, during undergrad, I worked at a bunch of artificial intelligence labs, and so when I left school, I ended up on this list of people that Google decided should come work there. So every year I'd get the email, like, hey, how do you feel about coming to interview at Google? And I'd be like, nah, I'm good, I'm good. I'll pass, hard pass on that one. But you know, earlier this year, you know, I was getting a little you know, bored you know, doing this kind of like tech lead mentorship. Like, I was like, well, let me see. Like, maybe Google is where I go to become a better engineer, right? Maybe not true, but I, you know, in my mind, right, I still believe in that trope of like, Google is the place you go to if you want to become a real engineer. Um, so I decided, let me interview. And I, I, I went through the process of, hey, I don't want to do Java in my interview. And my recruiter's like, yeah, you don't have to, but you probably be in your best interest if you do Java. <laughs> so I, I caved in. Um, and, and I'll talk about that process a bit more. But before moving on, I'd like to talk about another gang of four. Um, and I, I think this is interesting because uh, Michael sort of hinted at this earlier, right? The gang of four, the other gang of four, are these design patterns um, that we're, we're all familiar with, right? You know, the gang of four actually refers to the authors of the book, right? But the design patterns in the book are the ones that we think of as most interesting, particularly for me going through school, right? The things like the strategy pattern, the adapter pattern, these very interesting patterns that emerge from object-oriented programming become the dominant way in which you get judged as a programmer. Do you know the strategy pattern, right? There are many job interviews where I go into and that's a question, like, and I'm like, well, I do know what it is, but like, how is that relevant to like my work? Right? But I think the question really is, do you know these patterns and are you, uh, do you believe in these patterns as being useful for writing good software? I think the missing component there is, of course, these are not the only patterns. Right? There are other patterns, like the gen server pattern, that I think the majority of programmers who have spent the majority of their careers doing object-oriented programming have no idea that there is such a thing as a monad, such a thing as a, a gen a functor. Like, they don't know these things precisely because uh, there is massive dominance of the existing paradigm that means you don't have to know these things. So what does it mean to resist, right? I, I started thinking about these a lot. For, for Gramsci, to resist is impossible at the realm of, of attack, right? So for Gramsci, you, know, you can't go to Google and just like say Java is bad. Like that's not a, a, a useful strategy for resistance because you are irrelevant, right? You as an individual uh, cannot force structural change. In the same way as I cannot you know, go to the US government and say like the US military shouldn't do X, right? That's an irrelevant concept. So for Gramsci, the only way to actually have a challenge to power is actually at the realm of ideas, right? Around culture, around thought, to begin to challenge institutions at the realm of ideas, not at the realm of actual physical force. So here I am prepping for my Google interview. I go to Nigeria for a month in December to see my family, and while there, I'm studying for the Google interview, right? So I've got the, there's a book called Cracking the Coding Interview, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, which is literally all the interview questions, um, which is another question. Uh, why can I buy a book? That <laughs> oh, man. 
Okay, so I go to Nigeria. I'm studying for these interviews. Um, and at some point, I, I sort of, I decide that, okay, this is kind of annoying. Like, I'm doing these job exercises. Like, it's kind of boring. Like, uh, it's, it's all known, right? So, well, it'd be kind of interesting to translate these from Java to Elixir just to at least see, like, you know, like, do I still have the ability to read and translate code? Um, so I start doing this, and it's incredibly fun. So I decide, well, I'm just going to translate all the questions into Elixir. That way, at least I'm studying the questions they want me to study, but I'm going to do it in a language that's interesting, and I'll just walk in, I'll solve the problems in Elixir, and it should be fine, right? This is how I convince myself to do the interview in Elixir. So one, one instance that I'll kind, of, I'll kind of talk through quickly is this idea of an LRU cache. And it's essentially a least recently used cache. You keep a cache of items, you keep track of what was least recently used so you can pop it off. Now, I go ahead and I implement this. I implement the get and put operations. And I'll skip ahead a bit because at first I'm like very excited and then I get to this point where I'm really sad because I was like, well, this looks good in Elixir and it works. Um, and I'm typing the code on my computer and it's like running. And I was like, wait, but the problem asks for me to solve or to have constant time access. And I was like, well, that's, that's going to be tough when I have an immutable data structure that I'm using to keep my map. Um, and so I eventually I go back and I start studying. And I'm like, well, like I'm, Elixir under the hood does the closure thing. So it uses HAMT. It doesn't actually like share memory. So I, at best, I'm logarithmic in performance. But like over time, it amortizes. So like maybe it's OK. And I'm like, well, there's no way I can explain all of this to an interviewer in 45 minutes when I'm trying to get a job at Google. And they're going to ask me, like, well, can you just do it in a way that's not Elixir so we can achieve the performance guarantees that the question asks you for? And then I would have to explain to them why this is ultimately a magic trick, right? Because if you want to do real programming at scale, you have to do things uh, that necessitate concurrency and distributed you know, concepts at the very base level, right? So if you do this in Java, you actually would never do what the programming interview question asks you. So this is never, this programming interview is actually a trick, right? Like no one would ever do this thing you're telling me to do, right? No one would ever share memory, memory between two processes at scale because then you'd have to have locks and distributed locks or a nightmare. So no one actually does this in production, not even Google. So why am I forcing myself to translate what are true programming principles that even Google admits it needs to use and trying to like reduce those to a simple interview question that actually would cause bad things to happen in production? And that's when I realized that this is the trick of the object-oriented paradigm, right? Particularly at the level of the program interview is to say, well, if you're a good programmer, you can write shitty <laughs> interview code. But that, of course, is asinine. Um, there's another example I can give about factories and why factories don't make sense and why you probably shouldn't do them and why they are emblematic of the falsehood. Uh, of the, they hide the fact that most object-oriented languages have significant faults that you know, Java is attempting to, with Java 8, really reconcile by essentially stealing the majority of functional programming techniques. But we won't talk about that. What I want to conclude with is what I've been thinking more about. Because I, I, I've given this talk a few times, and people always like, ask me at the end, you are like, well, like, do you think like, Java's bad? Like, I'm like no, like, Java's great. You should totally use Java if you have to use Java. Um, but the problem is, in today's world, you have no other choice. Right? Like, and I mean, I mean that in a real sense. We're lucky that there's 100 like so people here. We're doing Elixir things. It's great. Um, but this is like a minority. This is a niche. And most places you go, including where I work at MailChimp, people are like, what is functional programming? And it's, I think half of that is sort of argumentative. It's like, what, like, really, what is that? And the other half is confusion. Like, why in the world would I ever do functional programming? And I think that's an interesting point because I think we live in a world in which object-oriented programming dominates by far. And the danger of that is not that people write bad software. That's definitely a danger. But the more important danger is that in the midst of today's society where everyone is obsessed with diversity, everyone wants to hire more black people and brown people and green people and yellow people, whatever color, right? Everyone wants every color in the rainbow to be in their company, 
But no one really wants to ask the fundamental question of like, if I come to your company, am I having an enjoyable experience? Am I writing software in a language that feels fun to me, right? Does me having fun at work matter? And I think the answer today is no, uh, because we want you to write Java or whatever language it is, right? You know, if it's, I don't know, PHP tomorrow, right? Um, I think there's a lack of thought about the diversity of programming languages we use. And that seems odd in a world in which like everything is a Docker container and no one really cares what's inside your Docker container. I just really care about the service level contract. I don't really care what's inside your thing. You can write it in Haskell, you can use Monads all day long. I don't really care. And I think the more we begin to think about linguistic diversity and diversity of thought around how we all express programming, I think the less you know, challenging it will be for us to not only attract new people into the community, but also retain those people um, without having them you know, pull their hair out because they have to write Java servlets. Um, with that, I'll conclude. Thank you.